Hello. Uh, it's hello. 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 Hello there. Welcome back to the Space School. Uh, today we're going to be doing What If Padme Divorced Anakin During the Clone Wars. Before we begin this video, special thanks to our patrons, voice actors, everyone else part of my team. What if she has to win a free lightsaber in our next giveaway? Watch the end of the video. Tell exactly how you can win. Our story begins in 19 BBY. The Clone Wars is at its peak. The struggle between the Separatists and the Republic is ready to climax in a fury of elongated combat. The war has thickened and the Republic itself has begun to break into Separatist territory. While attempts to neutralize the war and bring in a new era of peace had failed due to sabotage, the Republic was in the war to win it. There was no going around that. The time for peace had come and gone, and now the Republic was going to force itself to win. On the insides of each faction, there were heroes and there were villains. And at the moment, the Republic Senator, Padme Amidala, was dealing with one of those villains. His name was Rush Clovis. This was already a tense atmosphere. Padme working with a known traitor was already a high-risk operation, mostly because it seemed as if Rush was trying to levy power for himself so that he may get a hold of the banking clans on Scipio. The tension was rightly placed because of that, but for someone like Padme, there were two blades coming at her from each side. She was tough, resilient, but on the other side of Rush Clovis was her husband, Anakin Skywalker. See, Anakin wasn't exactly fond of Rush Clovis. Padme and Rush had a relationship in the past, and Anakin didn't trust Clovis to say the least. So after a little excursion to Scipio, the trio were on Coruscant. Being that Padme couldn't disclose her relationship with the Jedi General to Rush, he proposed a date of sorts. Padme would accept his offer, and the two of them would have a dinner, and so on and so forth, leading them back to Padme's residence. Without Padme's consent, Rush leaned in for a kiss on Padme, just at the perfect time for the broken one to walk into the room. He wasn't exactly thrilled about this, a fight would ensue, and without the force, Anakin would beat the living soul out of Rush Clovis, to which Padme would be left distraught, and on top of that, the Nebu guard would come in. Rush wasn't a snitch, and he obviously didn't need any more stitches, so he kept quiet. The guard escorted Rush to a medical room, and Padme went with him. Anakin was left bereft. Terrible pain was in his heart, and he felt lost. He knew what he did was wrong, and he made his way to the entrance of the building to await for his wife to come down. It would be 30 or 40 minutes later that she would find Anakin sitting there. Of course, both of them had heavy emotions on their mind, especially after the brawl that had just ensued, ruining expensive furniture in the upstairs part of the residence. Anakin was genuinely concerned for Rush. He didn't mean to do what he did, because he really violated him in a way. The way he beat him up, it was just absolutely vile. Padme admitted that Rush was fine, but she hadn't to address what had just happened. Anakin was very rightly apologetic, but with a relationship built on lacking fundamental communication, Padme jumped over talking about it to accusing the relationship of being fragile, built on pillars of sand, ironic, and surrounded in secrecy. Padme told Anakin that their bond wasn't a real relationship, and because of it, they are both living a lie. Anakin asked Padme what she was trying to say. Padme looked at Anakin, still seeing the markings of Rush's plastered face all over Anakin's metallic glove, and she looked into Anakin's eyes and told him that she didn't just want a break, she wanted a divorce. Anakin's heart shattered into a billion pieces. He didn't try and resist. Padme just told him that she didn't want to talk to him, see him, or get any communications from him from here on out. Because their relationship wasn't under any records, there wouldn't have to be worried about much. It was similar to just a regular breakup. Anakin just nodded his head as Padme turned around and walked back into her residence without turning back. Anakin slowly stepped out to his ship and sat down in the cockpit. He took off and flew through Coruscant. His mind was absolutely gone. He felt so many emotions, most of it was just sadness. Some of it was anger with himself, and pieces were just lost, the rest of it was. He really couldn't place his finger on what he was feeling because all he could feel was despair. The shimmering lights of Coruscant were beautiful, tranquility and the sound of speeders, bars, live music and the smell of the concrete jungle surrounded him. But not even the beauty of Coruscant could take Anakin out of his mind. He pulled a ship around to the upper part of the level decks, stepping off near 79's, a clone trooper bar. The 501st was currently on Coruscant, so he might see one of his boys there by accident. Anakin walked out and told R2 to stay with the ship, as he placed his hand on the little droid's head for an elongated period of time, as if he was holding on to something that no longer existed. Anakin walked through the crowded streets, retiring from the conflict both in the galaxy and from his mind. The people of the Corps, especially Coruscant, had the luxury of not being present in the war, nor seeing the travesties of such. It was amateur hour in Upper Coruscant, all the academy kids were out, upper level education kids too. Most if not all of them were the same age as Anakin, running around with their friends, bar hopping, and taking in the enjoyment of life without the problems of the galaxy. Who could blame them? It was a miserable galaxy, and Anakin was the walking embodiment of such. Anakin stepped through the crowds, taking note of groups of people, 
But those who stood out the most were the couples, arms locked around each other, stars in their eyes, and the twilight in their teeth as they smiled at each other. Anakin felt sick to his stomach, looking at them. He turned and walked over to the ledge, looking down across the downtown city. Lights filled everything. Everywhere he looked, he saw Neon dancing off the reflection of the speeders. Friends dancing and laughing. It was like slow motion. Their intoxication was freedom. A whole weekend to live it up and excite themselves before the grind continued. Anakin saw their lives and wondered what it would be like. He always wondered what it was like watching the streets and teens and young thugs on Tatooine doing the same things that the people on Coruscant were doing now. Over the last decade, he hadn't had time to think about it, let alone notice it, having spent so much time cooped up inside the Jedi Temple. When he first got there, he snuck out to see it, but that was no longer the case. Anakin turned around. One of the bands playing around a local bar behind him caught his attention. It was a dindy band, playing some up-tempo, emotionally charged music. It wasn't the classic jizz sound so prevalent inside of clubs or criminal palaces. Anakin decided he'd take a step in. Be around people of his own age, living it up. Sure, he was a Jedi, but at the moment, who the hell really cares? Anakin skipped through the crowd, tossing and turning between lumps of people from all different walks of life pushing past a group of Rodians and following two Twi'leks into a bar called Kareen's Nest. It was a local bar named after a Twi'lek pod racer that was making lengths across the Outer Rim. His team was pretty famous, and he had a great new crew chief named Zena Pax. Anakin remembered seeing Kid Kareen at the Boonta Eve Classic once, but he didn't show up because he didn't like the environment, and he especially didn't like Saboba. When Anakin walked into the bar, it looked entirely like Ryloth. Made sense, considering Kid Kareen was a Twi'lek. Anakin walked up to the bar and placed himself down. The bartender asked what he wanted, and Anakin asked for a straight Revnog, a classic drink in the core. Anakin looked around the bar. It was partially a casino, and the dindy band was pulling in crowds. The bar was incredible, three different stories with three different bands playing on each level. Anakin stuck to the first floor. It was the loudest and most energetic. People were in front of the band dancing, and Anakin was as still as a carbonate wall decoration. Looking at the drinks, sit motionlessly on the countertop. A couple people walked up, ordered their drinks, and moved away. Anakin swirled the Revnog around in his hand, watching the liquid twist around before he placed it back down. Someone brushed up next to him, to which Anakin turned his head over to look. It was a Twi'lek woman. She smiled at Anakin, grabbed her drink, and then walked away. Anakin shook a weak smile out of himself before turning back to what he was doing. So many thoughts ran through his mind. He couldn't focus on anything. The music from the bar was remarkable. It covered up all the tracks of his own sadness. Anakin took a swig from his drink before turning to see the people cheering at the sabak table. When Anakin turned back, there was a hand in front of him. Anakin asked the man what he wanted. The man looked at Skywalker and snidely asked if he wanted some death sticks. Anakin shook his head. The man presented another case, telling Anakin it was the best on the market. Anakin thought for the moment, and then he shrugged his shoulders before tossing the dealer a couple Republic credits. Anakin's heartbreak put him into a perpetual state of, who really gives a shit? A couple hours later, Anakin was in the middle of the dance floor, making friends, or more or less a couple of people that he might remember in the late afternoon, or maybe just not remember. At around 4 in the morning, the bars began to close and the nightlife began to start to die down. The party was over for the night, though some of the people still had energy, and the party could continue. As everyone fled the bar, the group of Twi'leks, Doros, and Bothans came up to Anakin. One of the guys told Skywalker that he should go to Corellia. The party would pick up there. Anakin shrugged his shoulders and asked for the location. He was given the location and the direct coordinates, and then told them that he would be there. The trip through hyperspace would provide a perfect buffer for the party animals until they could start up again. Just a little bit to take the edge off before they got right back into the party. Anakin got to R2 and plugged in the coordinates and asked R2 to take over. The little droid knew Anakin wasn't functioning too well. For what reason, he didn't really know, but he did know, as Skywalker asked, that he would take him to Corellia. On the other side of the city, Padme laid awake in her room. She couldn't sleep. She had a stressful couple of days coming up, and she couldn't do anything but think about if she was too cruel towards Anakin or not. She definitely was mad at him, but in all retrospect, he was protecting her. She didn't want the kiss rush, and Anakin still went too far. There was a lack of discussion between the two of them. They needed more communication. After all, they had always had communication issues. Regardless, it didn't excuse either of them. She went too far by suggesting a divorce, and Anakin, clearly visibly anger, management was needed. But she couldn't contact him, and he couldn't contact her. Well, technically, she could contact him, but she couldn't. He turned off all of his communication devices and went off the grid. Not even the Jedi knew where Anakin was. Skywalker, on the other hand, woke up on Corellia. For partiers on Coruscant, one of the best planets for post-party was Corellia. The main city was often going into the midnight hour if Coruscant was left at 4 in the morning. 
It was a perfect way to allow the party to continue. Anakin was so off of his mind at this point that he didn't really care about anything. Nothing really mattered to him. Honestly, for him, nothing did. The death sticks were certainly not helping his thoughts. Skywalker and his new group of friends left into the party and began doing their thang. It was one of those most free nights for Anakin in his entire life, and he really didn't know how to feel about it. When Anakin woke up, he looked around. He wasn't inside of a building, he was sleeping on the ground. Anakin reached for his lightsaber, and by some miracle, it was still there. Anakin looked out across the sea, listening to the sound of star cruisers landing and taking off. Anakin frankly couldn't remember much after the dude asked him if he wanted death sticks. There was no one around him. He just adjusted himself up and looked around, trying to get an idea of where he was, what he did, and where his ship was. Anakin put his head and his hands and stretched his neck while taking a deep breath. He heard a little whistle and looked over to his joy to see R2, but the little droid rolled up next to Anakin and sat himself down quietly. Anakin put his arm around the droid and leaned his head up against him. Anakin asked R2 what happened last night, and his little friend explained in great detail everything that happened. Anakin told R2 that he would not be doing that again. Sure, it was freeing, but it didn't solve the hole in his heart. It was a temporary solution to a long-term pain. R2 whistled at Anakin, and he looked at R2 and nodded his head. It was a very endearing message from his little friend. R2 essentially told Anakin that he had the opportunity to make the best from this, to learn from this example. Of course, R2 was just pulling information off the galactic Wyatt Reb on self-help. But for Anakin, this was extremely, at the very least, helpful. It's not like any of the Jedi would have been able to articulate that to Anakin. Anakin and R2 sat there for about 30 minutes or so before they got up and made their way back to their ship. On their way back to the ship, a little boy ran into him. He apologized with a grin and started running away. Anakin noticed something and then looked down to see that his lightsaber was stolen. Anakin turned around and reached out with the force and pulled the kid back towards him. Anakin told the kid to drop his lightsaber. The young boy was very unhappy that he had been caught, but he also didn't understand how he was caught at all. Anakin asked him what his name was. The little boy said his name was Han. Anakin asked Han why he tried to steal Anakin's lightsaber. Han shrugged his shoulders, telling the Jedi Knight that a kid's gotta eat. Anakin sighed. He thought about his problems in comparison to Han's, because Han was in the same place Anakin used to be. So the Jedi Knight leaned down and held out his hand for his lightsaber. Han reluctantly gave it over, but his stomach was audibly grumbling. Anakin took his lightsaber and pulled out a couple thousand Republic credits from his belt and dropped it in Han's hand. The kid thanked Han and then ran off. Skywalker turned around and walked with R2 to where they parked the ship. Once they got there, they got in and took off for Coruscant. This little act of random kindness for Anakin made him feel just a little bit better. Something about that kid from Corellia made Anakin think back to the person his child self wanted to become. He wanted to see every star in the galaxy, he wanted to help people, and he wanted to be better than who he was when he was a slave. And yet all he did was make himself a slave to his own emotions, and in a way, it was killing him. Anakin, missing the irony of his servitude to the Jedi, but clearly seeing how he was enslaving himself to emotions that were very clearly betraying him. When Anakin got back to Coruscant, he blocked Padme's frequency, as per request, and then returned to the Jedi Temple. Technically, she didn't say that, but Anakin figured that she wasn't coming back, and so he blocked her frequency for her. After a night of letting loose, Anakin came back to reality, and when he returned to Coruscant, the Council dispatched him out to the Outer Rim, immediately. Anakin understood and prepared to go back into the war zone. When Anakin loaded up with the 501st, he was clearly off his game. Whether it was a breakup or the hangover, he wasn't really sure, but it was very noticeable. Anakin was able to gather his composure in front of the Jedi Council before being dispatched, but now he was just sloppy. Once the fleet was in hyperspace, he went to his quarters to lay down for the time being to ease over the hangover. As much as it was clear to Anakin that he thought he was able to get away with it, his loyal second-in-command noticed everything. About an hour into hyperspace, Captain Rex would knock on Anakin's quarters' doors. Anakin was summoned from his nap, to which he was surprised to see Rex at his door. Technically, it wasn't a big deal. Anakin never told anyone not to come to his quarters to talk to him. Skywalker opened the door and saw Rex. Anakin's eyes were bloodshot and his hair was everywhere it shouldn't have been. Bloodshot not from the death sticks, but from the sleep. Rex asked if Anakin was alright. Anakin gave a half-hearted yes, to which Rex placed his hand on Anakin's shoulder. Rex told Anakin that if he needed to talk, he was always here. Anakin smiled a little as Rex turned away. Anakin watched Rex start down the hallway. Anakin's thoughts came to life as they ripped out of his mouth. Rex turned around with visible shock on his face. Rex walked back over and apologized to Anakin. Skywalker shook his head, saying that what happened was his fault. Rex asked how, to which Anakin explained the entire situation to Rex. 
the good captain asked Anakin if he could control these emotions or that feeling he got from the Force. Still not really conceptualizing how it really worked, Anakin shrugged his shoulders. Most of the time, he used the dark side as a reactionary device, but having lost his wife, it felt like not controlling those actions led to exclusive pain for him. Rex told Anakin that if he were in the same position, he would accept what happened, but he would try to find a way to avoid reacting in such a way. If that dark nature only brought him pain, then there was no point of using it. Anakin felt this way, but hearing it helped him visualize his own thoughts. Rex told Anakin that the boys in blue always had his back. He just needed to remember that. And even more than that, Obi-Wan always did too. Even though Jedi aren't supposed to talk about it, Rex believed that Obi-Wan would try his best to understand Anakin no matter what. Anakin always had his doubts, but Rex told Anakin that Obi-Wan loved Anakin like a brother, like a son. He just needed to remember that. Anakin was holding back tears, but he held them in until Rex left the room. While it was a simple talk, it's what Anakin needed to hear, and it made him feel as if he could go to his master to talk about what he was feeling. Anakin laid in his room and thought. He knew he could go on a vicious rampage. He could probably even rip the galaxy in half if he put his mind to it. But seeing that all of his anger and rash decision making only caused him pain, why would he? Acting as such lost him his wife, and maybe even is how he lost his mother. Anakin's guilt for slaughtering the Tuscans resurged. He hadn't thought about it in a good while, but the very fact that he did it bothered him sometimes. Sure, he didn't like the Tuscans, but he killed an entire village for the actions of one or two individuals. Anakin would eventually return to the bridge and have a bit more powerful of a presence. He felt a lot better, still mending his broken heart, but nonetheless better. Anakin made a goal to R2, a goal to consistently avoid choosing the path that led to darkness. If he acted in rage or anger, R2 could do a little zip zap on him. Now, this didn't mean that Anakin couldn't act in a way to save others or to get what was best for the Republic, but it meant that he couldn't personally inflict harm on others if they offended him or made him personally angry. It was a little more complex or difficult, but all Anakin knew is that he wanted to fix himself, not for anyone else, but for him. The war would continue. After his siege in the Outer Rim, he would come to learn that Scipio was attacked by the Separatists and Senator Amidala was alright. Anakin was happy to know that she was safe, but the thought of her tarnished his heart. He didn't wish her any harm, and he only wished her happiness, even if it meant it wasn't with him. In a way, this breakup would fill Anakin's heart and mind with more compassion and understanding than he would have had otherwise. The war would eventually lead to the Siege of Mandalore, to which nothing would change. Ahsoka would still go to Mandalore, and Skywalker and Kenobi would still save Palpatine whilst killing Dooku in the process. Upon arrival to Coruscant, Anakin would avoid the politicians and return to the Jedi Temple. After doing so, he would be beckoned to the Senate building, to which Palpatine would inform him that he would be appointed to become Palpatine's personal representative on the Jedi Council. Anakin was appreciative for this promotion, and would take it with great respect, but without Padme, knowing of her pregnancy with his children, or a real desire for the rank of master, it really didn't make much of a difference to him. When Anakin presented himself in front of the Jedi High Council, he would tell the Council that he was appreciative for the nomination by Palpatine. He would do by their will, because it was their Council after all. Anakin butted heads with the Jedi more than not, but the truth is, he wasn't in any rush to become a Jedi Master. He had no real need to want to get to the restricted section of the Jedi Archives, so being a Jedi Master didn't change much for him, neither did it being on the Council. The Jedi Council members respected Anakin's humility, especially since they didn't expect it. Anakin was genuinely pleased to be on the High Council because of Palpatine, but even more surprised that the Council allowed Skywalker to stay on the Council by Palpatine's request. Over the past six or seven months, Anakin had become much more tame. Sure, he gutted Admiral Trench a couple weeks before in Anaxis, but other than that, Anakin was hanging in. The loss of Ahsoka and Padme were rough, but now Ahsoka was back in his life because of her siege on Mandalore, and with Obi-Wan being sent out to Utapal, it was only a matter of time until the war ended. Anakin took this spot on the council with great respect, and still, even though he butted heads with the council members about going to Utapal instead of Obi-Wan, or having a spy on the Chancellor, he was still far from being a disciple of the dark side. When he went to spy on Palpatine at the Bubble Ballet, he was careful to express how he felt, though Palpatine himself was giving off weird vibes. He was talking about things that Anakin didn't know how he knew or why he knew. Sure, he was a politician and an elder one at that, but these were stories about the Sith. Palpatine would deduce that Anakin was spying on him, but he was having a little bit of trouble making headway on Skywalker. 
Palpatine would start putting visions in Anakin's head for the next day or so about the death of Ahsoka at the hands of Darth Maul. It was his best chance at making Anakin crave knowledge of the dark side. These visions would plague Anakin's dreams during his stay on Coruscant, but as troubling as they were, Anakin trusted Ahsoka. He believed Ahsoka could defeat Maul, though Anakin would have to confide in someone for a second opinion. Most of the more tangible masters weren't inside of the temple. The only one that was, was Mace Windu. Did Skywalker really want to do that? He figured he might as well, the only reason being that if he had to serve on the council with Mace Windu, he might as well get used to working with him and being comfortable still talking to him. Anakin would ask for time with Windu. It would be tense initially. Windu sat on the seat crisscrossed, looking at Anakin intensely as he explained his visions. Windu told Anakin that dreams come and go, to not take them so literally, the same thing Yoda would have told him. There would be good ones and there would be bad ones, reminding Anakin that he was the one that taught Ahsoka. Anakin nodded his head with a questionable present on his face. Mace told Anakin that Kenobi beat Maul multiple times. Obi-Wan taught Anakin, and Anakin taught Ahsoka. The chances of Ahsoka doing the same as Obi-Wan were entirely likely. Mace told Anakin to have faith in his apprentice. It was normal for one to worry or even have dreams about it. Mace even had a vulnerable moment, telling Skywalker that he used to worry about Depa when she became a knight, but the time will go away, and he will trust his student to be fine on their own. Anakin told Mace that he was very appreciative for the talk, it meant a lot. Truth be told, Windu didn't even hate Anakin. He did have his doubts, of course, sure, everyone did, but Windu wouldn't turn away Skywalker, ever, even though they didn't exactly get along. Mace had a similar approach to the situation that Skywalker did. If they were going to be working together, then they might as well get used to being around each other so that they can work together better. They were good together on an axis not long before, so what were the chances of them still being good together or even building a great friendship out of this? It wouldn't be more than 24 hours before Anakin would find out that Palpatine was a Sith Lord. Anakin would restrain himself, but he really did want to kill Palpatine, though based off of his personal growth over the last several months, it wasn't worth the risk. Instead, he would tell Mace Windu about it, to which Windu would realize that their greatest threat had come true, telling Skywalker to stay in the Council Chambers until the Jedi Council returned. Windu wasn't trying to claim glory for himself, rather he wanted Skywalker to be kept away from making a rambunctious decision. Windu would also inform Skywalker that Ahsoka was coming back from Mandalore. She beat Maul and she had won the siege. This was an instant relief to Anakin. Ahsoka had come on the comlinks just a few moments after Anakin left the room earlier. When the two of them split up, Anakin would spend his time in the council chambers until the sun set across Coruscant. He would think about Ahsoka, but he knew that Ahsoka was heading back from Mandalore with Maul in custody. There was no reason for him to panic. He could sense the tension coming from the Chancellor's office though, and in a worry of the Sith winning, he would leave the chambers. Initially, he was going to stay, but his connection to Palpatine told him otherwise. Mostly, Anakin wanted to be sure that the Jedi came out on top. When Anakin arrived, he saw Windu holding Palpatine to a lightsaber point. Sidious was pleading for mercy, but Anakin knew he was a Sith Lord. Instead of interfering, Anakin would allow Palpatine to almost kill himself with force electricity, to which Sidious would be left in pain and scars across his face. Windu would deal the final blow to Sidious, killing him instantaneously. Anakin wouldn't miss a beat. He wouldn't try to stop it. And while Palpatine was a mentor, once he found out he was a Sith Lord, all those years of bonding disappeared immediately. Windu would sheathe his blade and stick his hand out towards Skywalker. The two of them would firmly grasp each other's hands and shake them. Mace told Anakin that he couldn't have been prouder of him. Anakin's smile could light up the galactic core alone. He appreciated it more than he could express but now they had to clean up the mess. And good thing Anakin came because the two of them had to be a lot quicker to clean up the entire office. It was a bit of a mess. The two Jedi would search Palpatine's office once cleaning up most of it and find all the information they needed to accuse Palpatine of what he'd done to make their actions seem necessary. They would also remove all the files of what had happened before the build up to the battle because it seemed as if Palpatine intentionally messed with the security system before the Jedi arrived. The next week would see radical change in the lives of the galaxy and the life of Anakin Skywalker. The Republic would accept the evidence put out by the Jedi. While Jedi Masters across the galaxy would return victorious, the 212th claiming victory on Utapau, the Wolf Pack on Kato Nemodia, 327th on Felucia, and the Galactic Marines on Megiddo, and so on, the Separatists would surrender, and with the defeat of General Grievous and Darth Sidious, the greatest threat to the galaxy were abolished from existence. Maul, on the other hand, was locked away inside the Jedi Temple, inside of the Mandalorian sarcophagus for the rest of his life. And for Ahsoka, she would have a difficult time deciding, but with the war ending, she believed that the Jedi could make everything right. On Mandalore, she believed the Jedi would continue to warmonger, but since the war was ending, she decided that she could join the Jedi, because now she had the opportunity to make the galaxy better as a Jedi. 
and for the Chosen One, he'd be promoted to Jedi Master. And not long after, he would find out that his ex-wife had his children. Padme would be able to get into contact with Skywalker through Bail Organa. The two of them would discuss what their relationship now meant, and now that they had two children, how they would go about that. Anakin admittedly was hesitant, but he would agree to help raise them on Coruscant, because they were his. Padme and Anakin would have some sorting out to do, both of them admitting their own wronging in the months before. It would lead to the rebuilding of their relationship full of communication. In the galaxy, free from oppression, not just of the war, but of the Sith for the rest of time. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our story. Again, special thanks to Benjamin Wells, Jonathan, Pimp Daddy Bane, Icy Raptor, Apollo Mad Mad Studios, Anakin003, and Gore for supporting the channel. Hit the like this video. We've got other videos coming out this week. If you see what else, I'll below right comments, to a crossover. Check out the Twitch, community, Discord, and Patreon. Support me in other ways. I got all those channels. Check out these other channels right here. Great content coming out on all of them every Saturday. One of them is something new every Saturday. Uh, the cinema channel is the one I'm most excited for, so go check that one out. I got a video out there right now, and that one's probably going to have. In my opinion, probably the best videos on it because I love movies. Um, and let's, uh, for the lightsaber giveaway, go down below this doc, click on the doc, write on the name of the doc, and subscribe. We're having about three lightsabers on uh, 50,000 subscribers. And don't pay attention to the comment section. That is not me, that is a scammer. Let's talk about our story. So, Anakin is a human, right? We know that, we can see that. And I know what you're thinking, but he would destroy the universe. He's a human being. Like, like, I know Anakin's a badass. I know he is. He's he's a main character, okay? He's everyone's favorite character, but you have to look past that. He's a human being at heart, you know? Padme is, is the first person that he really received unconditional love for um, since his mother, or from since his mother. And that person breaking his heart, it could go two ways. Yes, he could definitely want to destroy the universe, destroy the galaxy, but he's a human being, you know? When your heart is broken, do you go on a rampage of killing people? I don't think so. You probably get really sad and you go for a drive and then you make some questionable decisions, but you definitely don't go on a murdering rampage, do you? No, you don't. And Anakin is the same way. And that's what I was trying to portray here, because Anakin is a human being, and I feel like any other creator, any other uh, writer that would have done this exact what if, would have made Anakin go on a rampage, and that's... That's fine, that's fun and exciting and all, but that's not true to the character of Anakin Skywalker. Yes, he has moments where he's just blatantly angry, full of rage, but this is Padme. This isn't just somebody else. This isn't, like, any random person. This isn't, like, the Zygerian cat lady that, like, had a crush on him. It's not like, it's not like that, where he had no issue killing her. This is Padme. This is the person, like, he's first love. The first person he really fell in love with. Like, are you an angel? Like, I'm a person. My name is Anakin. Literally, he says this. And he's like, I am a person, my name is Anakin. He is a person, and we have to look at Anakin like a person, as, as a real person. And the, the, the conflict between destroy the universe or an actual human interaction is what my, my story had to decipher. It's like, you expect coming into this that Anakin's going to rip the galaxy apart. He's going to turn into Abeloth and eat Coruscant, or turn into Nihilus and destroy the galaxy, or open up a black hole and destroy everything. And yeah, that's exciting, but that's boring at the same time. You expect that. That's not an emotionally complex story. That's not an emotionally charging story. And I wanted to give an emotionally charging story, which is exactly why I decided to go to something that I've never done before, something that you probably haven't seen since the story that had Xenopax in it. Shameless plug for the Anakin Never Being Discovered video, but I kind of went back to those roots. You guys love that video. It's one of the most underrated videos on the channel, but you guys seem to love that video. All the comments from that video tell me that you guys love that video, and um, what I wanted to do was I wanted to kind of bring that back a little bit, have that kind of human interaction where it's like, it's not just a big picture, it's not just action, guts, glory, and all that stuff, but it's, it's a human story, it's a story that we can all relate to, and something relatable, something that you can take out of the story, something that I can give to you as, as a writer, as a content creator, for you to take into your own lives, and that's something I always strive for. I always strive to have a couple lines that are supposed to stick in your mind, something that you can always take home, something you can that you can write down and just find relatable, something that that means something to you. That that's the that's the entire point of stories, and that's what Star Wars is, in my opinion. It's something that you can take home with you that has a deeper, more compelling narrative behind it. And and while Star Wars is fun with lightsabers and blasters and all that stuff, it's an emotionally complex story that's written for children. It's, it's a story written for children and it's an emotionally charging story and that's what I wanted this to be. I wanted to, to reflect what what George would have wanted it to be. I know I know George is famous for his wooden dialogue but 
he writes emotionally charging stories. That's why we fell in love with Star Wars, because they're emotionally charging. That's why Star Wars is as big as it ever got. It wouldn't be that big without the emotional capability of it, and it's all hidden behind sci-fi and spaceships and action and all that stuff. But it's truly a beautiful story, a Star Wars it is, and that's what I wanted to replicate. And and you know, I, I made some <laughs> some some snide kind of implants like indie music being dindy music, you know, kind of something like that. You know, jazz is jizz in Star Wars. I know ironic, but whatever. Um, but I wanted it to feel as immersive into the Star Wars story as possible, putting Anakin back to where he come he came from, like this underground area. Well, it's not underground. It's kind of like um, it's actually based on Nashville, a, a bar with three levels and three bands playing on each level, playing like rock or country or whatnot and that's kind of what that inspiration came from is is like this this thing that you see in like places like Nashville where it's like it's a party scene there's people just partying and he goes in and he's like surrounded by people partying and he gets you know he gets the death stick and he goes on a little trip and he ends up on Corelli and he's like what the hell did I just do and that's that's a human reaction that's Anakin's a human being you know he literally says my name is Anakin or I'm a human being or I'm a human and my name is Anakin or whatever I'm a person and my name is Anakin right like that's 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 what I wanted to tell. I wanted to tell something that's emotionally charging. I really, really hope that you guys enjoyed this because I, I put a lot of heart into all my stories, but um, this one in particular is, is a new personal favorite for me. Uh, and I haven't said that in a while. I mean, I like all the stories that I do and I always try and put out the best, but this one feels, um, it feels so much more um, emotionally, feels much more emotionally compelling from a narrative perspective rather than um, an action-y perspective. And I know you guys always want lightsaber duels and stuff like that. I mean, we all love them, but you know, I, I want, wanted to give something a little bit more filling than that. So I hope you all enjoyed this video. If you did, leave a like down below, do the things. I love you all, spread the love, and always remember my friends, may the force be with you.